from Psalm chapter 23. Probably the most famous of all the Psalms. Everybody pull out your pew Bible. Everybody know where to find the Psalms? Right smack dab in the middle. Let's read Psalm 23 together. This is a good short one that we all need to share together. <coughs> Listen now to the word of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here ends our reading from God's Old Testament word. May God bless it to our understanding. And our New Testament reading is from John chapter 10. It's found on page 759 of your New Testament. If you'd like to flip over and follow along with me since you already have the Bible out. And this passage picks up on the same thing. Where we have a new shepherd. Actually, let's go back. Well, yeah, start at verse 7 through 18. And Jesus is talking about here using sheep and gate analogies. He says, I am the door to the sheep. And uh, uh, he continues on with this particular line of thought. Listen now to the word of the Lord. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and may have it to the full or abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when the, he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep who are not of this sheep then. I must bring them in also. They too will listen to my voice. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. This is the word of the Lord. God. And let all God's sheep say, Amen. <laughs> and we are the sheep today. We'll go back and find it in. There it is. Is the Lord your shepherd? The Bible has many images to describe God's people. Some of us are called God's children. The New Testament calls us saints. We're called believers, disciples of Jesus, sometimes agents of light, all these things. But there's one very common image that runs throughout the Bible, and it's the one we have today. We are sheep. What does sheep say? Bad. We're sheep. Bad. <laughs> now, is this a flattering analogy? <clears throat> so, unfortunately, it's not the highest and 
most noble kind of analogy to be described as, but it's an accurate one. Sheep are dumb, defenseless creatures who panic easily and need lots of care. That sounds describes me. You can see my wife's back there nodding her head. So uh, we need this. We'd rather have a bolder image out there, an eagle or a lion with a big mane and a fierce roar and claws and teeth. The Bible doesn't call us that. It says the devil's like a lion prowling around trying to find some people to devour. But we are sheep, and sheep say, bad. <laughs> We gonna scare anybody away by saying that? <laughs> Is the lion gonna take much notice of that? It's like, mm, yummy. So, uh, Bible doesn't let us go in that direction. Uh, Ken Davis is a Christian comedian and uh, used some of his material on some youth retreats and stuff. And he actually grew up on a sheep farm, so he has a great talk called Super Sheep about what it's like to be raised with sheep. And he says they're really dumb. And they watched one day as a big herd of their sheep got in a panic and one sheep took off in one direction, the others took off and followed it. And that sheep couldn't see where it was going, so it went over a 15-foot bank. And what did all the rest of those dozens of other sheep do? Right over 15-foot right drop. They all piled up on each other. A lot of them were killed or had to be destroyed. It was just a big, awful mess. What do sheep have to defend themselves with? Laws, teeth, roar, they have little geeky hoofs, little blunt teeth, and what do they say? Yeah. Not going to scare many people away with that. And even worse of all, they taste really good too. Uh, we like to have roast lamb on a regular basis, so don't tell Mary that uh, he found her little lamb and had her for dinner one time. <laughs> You don't find lamb in the grocery store or anything like that, even though they call it that. Anyway, so much for our <laughs> uh, food analogies here today. But uh, sheep are also prone to wandering. They don't pay attention to what they're going. Now, no sheep ever says deliberately, I'm going to go wander over to the other side of the hill while the wolves are hanging out and they will find me and live the lamb and eat me and watch me die. No, sheep nibble. And they say one little clump of grass, and ooh, there's another little clump of grass, and another little clump of grass, and they keep going off in this direction. And before they know it, the shepherd and the rest of the flock are on the other side of the hill, and they are over there left exposed. So you gotta get the shepherd's hook, where is it over here, and reel them in. And that's why the shepherd had the rod and the staff, their tools of their trade, to help with this kind of thing. Uh, we're like the sheep. We have all these same tendencies. We're prone to wander. Not that we intentionally say, I'm going to go off in a bad direction, but we tend to do little things, neglect our devotions, neglect going to church on a regular basis, and soon the Christian life becomes less and less important to us, and then we're out there amongst the wolves, vulnerable to the ways of the world. That's not where we should be. Well, fortunately, we have our psalm in our New Testament passage today that give us good news that God is with us and for us, and God protects and provides for us sheep. Both of these passages are statements that God cares for us deeply and doesn't want to see bad things happen to us. And this calms us and reassures us that all will be well as we go through different stages and situations in life. We're going to spend most of our time here looking at the psalm portion of this reading uh, and break it down because... This is a classic statement of faith. It's written by David, as far as we know, who, what did he do as a youth? He was a shepherd, so he knew exactly what this was about. And so in these six short verses, he tells us in very economical language exactly what it meant to be cared for by a shepherd and how God's love and care for us works in the same way. Now, really, two images here in this psalm. One's an outdoor image, the sheep and the flock, and then once back in the house, God prepares a banquet for us. 
Uh, and then in between, there's also travel through dark and dangerous territory as well. But the good news there in this psalm is God's with us in all these situations. Well, what does God provide for us? God meets all our needs. There's no sense of want when you're in intimate fellowship and communication and communion with your Creator or your Savior, whichever way you want to put it. God is with us and for us. He wants to have that close bond, a spiritual fellowship with each and every one of his children. And God will take us to good places. It says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now, when I was a little kid, I took that very concretely and had a hard time understanding. God's my shepherd, and it's a good thing, why don't I want it? I didn't understand poetic language at that particular time, so it took me a while to finally figure out. It means I have no needs. God takes care of all my needs and concerns. I'm not lacking for anything in God's care. And in particular, he leads us in green pastures. Good place to go. Now, we live down at the other end of Elliot Bridge Road, where at that end where it hits Ramsey Street, what's out there? Big pasture full of sheep. So we get to hear this in the background behind our house and uh, look through the woods a little bit and see all this. But it's a lovely field. Isn't that a good place to hang out? Put your love and go and park there and have a picnic. Now it's all fenced, so they don't let people come in and do that and stuff. Of the, uh, but uh, it's out there. But when I think of this, I think of uh, going on out to some meadow or field somewhere, plopping down with a blanket, breaking in a picnic lunch, having a good time, throwing some frisbees. Isn't that a fun place to be? What happens when you have an afternoon like that with friends or family, your boyfriend or your girlfriend or whatever? Come back refreshed, restored, renewed. That's what God's care is all about. It's like a picnic. Or the next image is a different scene, but the same kind of idea. He leads me beside still waters. How many of y'all like to go to the lake or the river? Hang out and have a picnic there. What's that? The beach. The beach, okay. Those aren't quite as still, but, uh, but, uh, but the beach is a good place to hang out too. We all have a place where our soul is renewed. I just got back from the mountains. My wife and I are mountain people. We like the hills. In the valley, some people like the sandy beach, others like the river or a lake where you drop a hook in the water. How many fishing people are out there? We've got a number of them out there. Uh, maybe some are in the empty spots today because they're out there on the lake or something, uh, catching a few fish today, communing with God at that place. So, but uh, that's the other image. It's a good place to go and plop down and just unwind and experience God's creation and God's care and celebrate the good things of love. Uh, and as it goes on to say, this restores my soul. It renews, it refreshes us, it strengthens us. God's care is like that. And not only that, he leads us to those calm and serene places, he leads us to paths of righteousness. When there's moral confusion in this world, God leads us to the places where his will is clear and defined and spelled out for each and every one of us to walk in, for his name's sake, so that we can honor him and all that we do. All this is here. He wants us to preserve his name in the world, and for that purpose, he preserves us in the world and uh, calls us into service. And that's how it opens up. That's all peaceful and serene. But then it moves into a different little line here. Even though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me, it says. How many of y'all ever walked to the valley of the shadow of death? Or time of deep darkness in your life? Is life always the picnic in the meadow? Are sitting by the lake? No, we all have these dark and troubled times of life that we need to go through. Who is with us in those times? Are we alone? Do we face them by our own power? God goes with us. So when there's physical calamity, an accident or an illness, where there's spiritual calamity, where your world seems to cave in and you wonder what's going on, is God in control? Well, the word here is yes, God is in control. Doesn't mean everything good is happening around you, but God will guide you through those particular difficult times of love. 
And all the tools that God has of the shepherding trade, his rod and his staff. The rod, if you've ever seen one, was really like a club, closer to baseball bat. That's what they could whack on the head of a wolf or a lion to attach. The staff could be used for pulling sheep in or pushing predators away. Uh, and like one of the kids said, they hold up the shepherd and they get tired and bored out there in the field. That was a new use they hadn't thought of. So, uh, good, good lesson from our kids here today. So, but yeah, I'm sure it was very helpful as they climbed through the rocky territory. And if you've ever been to Israel, you know it's not the, the most friendly terrain. Uh, and uh, it was just different short times of the year that they could actually go out and keep sheep in the pasture in the springtime after the winter uh, weather went away and before the summer scorching heat baked all the grass out of the ground. But this is where God goes with us. And that's, those are the outdoor scenes here. And then it shifts again uh, to one more kind of setting. It moves indoors. And it's no longer God taking care of us out there in the fields, but God takes care of us and invites us into a great banquet. Anybody ever had a banquet in your honor? Like a rehearsal dinner for your wedding? Or graduation party? Or some athletic banquet or something of that nature? It's nice to be the guest of honor and be tampered and everybody say nice things about you. Well, that's God's kingdom. That's the image here. He prepares a table, of, prepares a table for you and you get to sit in the place of honor and anybody who's opposing you and opposing the ways of God well, they get to sit there and be pushed out and uh, excluded. The image here is much as if prisoners had been taken captive in battle or something, but God lifts up his people and uh, does not include those who oppose his ways. Now, God's love and grace and mercy is out there for everybody, as Jesus teaches us, but God particularly favors those who choose to favor him and hear his call and respond to his grace and mercy in life. And in fact, it goes on to show the other ways they were honored. Anointing a head with oil. Today, we don't do that kind of thing. Back in the ancient world, they poured oil over the head of a favored guest as a way of showing their favor for them. Today, we do the exact opposite. If we have a guest in our house, we say, here's the guest room, here's the guest bath, go take a shower, get cleaned up, get pretty, whatever you need to do. So we would do this a little bit different. But either way, it's showing God's care on our behalf. And then finally, our cup overflows. Whatever your favorite beverage is, coffee, tea, uh, caramel macchiato, whatever they call it, uh, Starbucks, or uh, Mountain Dew, or Coca-Cola, or whatever, uh, it's like it never ends. It just keeps bubbling up from the bottom in God's care. Here's a great example of a cup running over. I mean, this thing literally is very, very heavy. As you saw me drop it up here earlier today, this, this thing is full. And uh, you're sharing out the bounty of what you have, even just pennies and nickels and dimes that individually are not very much. But when we put them together, that takes care of the needs of many other people around us. So God is there, and there's no lack, no want in our lives. And what's our fitting response to be? I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If God has blessed you, if God's taken care of your needs, if God has sent his love, if God pays for your sins and the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, isn't it nice to show up and say thanks to God on a regular basis? That's our job as his believers, to be here as our youth figured out this morning in Sunday school, we add it up. Well, an hour in Sunday school and an hour in worship, that's not very much out of seven days, 24 hours, that's what, 164 hours a week or something like that. Can't do the math in my head. But out of that, God just asks a few in return, and that's the least we could give him. Or as I say, the three hour a week Christian, our worship, our study, our service every week, and some daily devotions to top it off, and you'll start growing as a Christian if you do that. But we give our time and energy back to the Lord because God has first given so much to us. And it's all a response to God's grace in our lives. Uh, we don't neglect the ways of the Lord or our spiritual connections. We want to make sure God gets the first and top priority in our life. And the good news is God's house is always open. 
we dwell in the house of the Lord, in this sanctuary, or Hope Mills, or wherever we happen to be placed for those of you who are from other places, but we gather here as often as possible. We're not legalists. God doesn't expect everybody to be here uh, every 52 Sundays of the year. We all travel and have other places to be at times, but the preponderance of the time, we need to be in God's house as much as possible. Now that's how the psalm tells this particular story, or captures this image. And Jesus picks up on this, and we'll just touch briefly on what he says there. Uh, we could do days and days on either of these passages. But Jesus claims to be not only is the Lord our shepherd, but who else? He is the good shepherd. Where the Lord, the psalm talks about God as a metaphor, Jesus comes and demonstrates his love in time, in history, in space here on this planet. And so what we have here is God coming near to us in the person of Jesus to build a deep, intimate bond with each and every one of us as the people of his kingdom, the sheep of his flock, whatever image you want to use it, Jesus is here with us and for us. He's the good shepherd, faithful, true, and putting the needs of the flock first. See, like a hired hand? A hired hand, when he sees danger coming, or she, what do they tend to do? So, you know, when you're just getting paid minimum wage, you're saying, I, I'm not getting paid enough to take on lions and wolves and ravenous animals out there in the woods. But when the shepherd owns the sheep, and is not hired, Shepherd's going to lay his life on the line because those sheep are the shepherd's livelihood. The wool they have, the meat, whatever he needs to do with them, that's how that shepherd makes his or her living. Will fight and even die for the sheep. And Jesus says he came to lay down his life for the sheep, and he does so willingly. He will lay it down, he will take it back up again because this is what the Father has commanded. So whatever burden you have in life, particularly your spiritual burden for your sins and your brokenness, Jesus pays the price as your shepherd. He's the good shepherd who lays down his life so that you, the sheep, will not be devoured by Satan or what other evil forces are out there in the world. And because of that, the sheep learn the shepherd's voice. They will follow him, and they will not follow other voices. If they're faithful disciples, that's the whole point of it. We have safety and security with Jesus. He leads us in the paths of righteousness that the psalm talks about. And he even goes to the cross and rises from the dead to assure us that we have the gift of eternal life. So let me conclude. Are you living for the shepherd? Is the Lord really the shepherd of your life? The one guiding, leading, controlling, shaping you for the future? God's love and care are great and deep and powerful, but they also demand a response from us. We give our love and obedience back to God because God has first given so much to each and every one of us. You place your life in the Lord's hands. God and his son Jesus love you and give you everything you have. Won't you dwell in the house of the Lord and in the presence of God, in this life, and forevermore, that's the greatest gift you have to experience and enjoy and to give your time and devotion back to the Lord created you. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. There's no greater promise in Scripture than that. Let's say thanks to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our shepherd and that you care for us and guide us through all the different good things and hard things of life. And that you also send Jesus to be the good shepherd, to lay down his life and to raise it up again, so that we might find salvation through him. Help us to respond joyfully with glad and generous hearts and to dwell in your house and to seek your presence each and every day. We seek these blessings in the name of Jesus, our shepherd.